Hello everyone, um, my name is Annabelle and my colleague Renata. We're splitting this into a kind of um, a binary session, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the genericness and Renata is going to talk a little bit more about the specific nature. So what we're um, talking about is the Unitech paradigm. Um, we are in Auckland, in New Zealand, and um, we have quite a different um, way of looking at things that say um, Australia does, so we're looking at it from our point of view. So um, this, now, if you're a graphic designer, please don't weep. <laughs> <laughs> just, this is a typical corporate kind of image, so please just, you know, just suspend all of that. Um, it's truly horrible. Anyway, um, Unitech, this is um, something that, you know, the Centre Organisation put out, and this is our, you know, supposedly our story, our narrative, whatever you want to say. Um, and so we've got a whole range of, you know, they're into these diamonds and you've got to have your core values and your diamonds. So in the middle here, this is um, like Unitech's um, values, enterprising, um, generosity of spirit, being accountable, student and customer focus, and of course being bicultural. Bicultural is a big issue for us. Um, that's, you know, it's just part of our upbringing and part of the way we think about things. But really the thing that we are here to talk about is this one here, which is teaching and learning. And the others are kind of peripheral, really. So one of the main things that has happened during this restructure um, started about a year and a half ago is about modernising the way that we teach and the resources and our approaches and how we um, prepare students for success. So as part of this, our um, teaching and learning unit, so our teaching and learning unit is called Tupun Akko, um, and they put, they put together this whole idea of learning and teaching and how um, it was going to be structured around what we call the living curriculum. And it's, it's not just about core content, it's about much more holistic learning in a bicultural dimension, all right, because it's always embedded within biculturalism, and how we can um, make an active and dynamic process of learning. So one of the things that we were talking about in our group this morning was um, about the fact that Unitech realises that to be a future oriented um, teacher, um, it does, irrespective of what the program, is that you need to have certain skills and some of those skills are technical, some of these are e-learning skills and some of them are just basic upgrading new skills. So we have a term um, in New Zealand that we use which is um, legacy staff. These are the staff that are not so interested in um, upskilling and learning how to use e-learning. And so a lot of it was about um, generating the ability for these staff to start learning things. So professional development. So it was deemed that every staff member, every academic needed to do 37 and a half hours of professional development. And so this is over a two year period. This is both good and both bad because for some people they embraced it and for others they didn't. But they're based around these three different um, teaching and learning models. So we've got the first one which is primarily on campus. It's a hybrid but with a strong face-to-face -face, um, focus. A highly blended hybrid with a strong online focus. And then also authentic work-based learning. So as we talked this morning, some of them, let's say, disciplines within architecture fit within, more within one than another. So obviously there are certain aspects of work-based learning, you know, when we have studios, when students are going out, so that that covers that. We, within architecture, we're probably never going to be entirely on the line. We're going to be some sort of fundamentally um, hybrid-based. So these are the things that Unitech is um, interested in, like collaboration, online learning, authentic work based work-based learning and independent learning, but they're all based about these three modalities. So every discipline within Unitech has to opt in to one of these kind of hybrids. So as part of that, um, what happened was that they got one unit, which is about teaching and learning, which is Dipuna Echo, they made another unit, and this other unit was called Tawaka Aroni. Um, waka basically means canoe, and so it's like the canoe of life, it's like the paddling of life. So this here is about how they determined that they were going to have five, five courses which are mandatory to every academic staff member. 
And so you've basically got them here. So you've got active learning, work-based learning, online and blended learning, Maldivangi uh, Māori, which is about the Pukamu, and assessment and feedback. So this is not negotiable. Everybody has to do this. Except for, obviously, there are some legacy staff that still don't want to do this. That's just the way it is. But then you've got these other recommended workshops. And, of course, this morning, <coughs> different people were talking about different things, like um, Echo 360, my portfolio, it's horrible, please don't use it. You know, it's really not a nice piece of software. You know, Blackboard collaborates. And then you've got a whole range of other things down here, which is about flip learning, um, embedding literacy, rubrics. We had a whole course about rubrics a couple of weeks ago. And so you need to kind of generate your 37 and a half hours. And I think the thing that's really interesting about this is that I don't know many other institutes that have mandated that staff have to do this professional development and that they realise that you can't just somehow absorb it. It's just not possible. You actually do need some teaching about how things work. So. Um, this is how, how we've kind of gone through the process, and this is um, Tawaka. So Tawaka basically got funding from our council to do a very interesting thing, which was to co-create and collaborate making course development. So they put what they call intensive course development, and an intensive course development is basically a um, 20 week period. So in this 20 week period, they pulled somebody out of a discipline, they backfilled that teaching and then brought in these other people to help create the content. All right, so it's pretty, from money terms, it's actually pretty intensive. But from a learning, holistic point of view, it's actually very good because that person is upskilling up and understanding. They might not be very good at whatever learning management tool they're using, but suddenly they become. So this is um, the walk, we generally just call it the walker because it's just easier. And so this was the intensive course development. So they had a subject matter writer. So for example, Renata was a subject matter writer for um, history and theory. They brought in a um, curriculum editor, and they brought in a learning designer. So somebody that was going to do the writing, the content, and somebody that was going to make the, it manifest within Moodle. And we used different strands of different things working into Moodle. And it was over a 20-week period. So as you can see, if you're purely doing this on the money terms, this makes no sense whatsoever. This is like a complete anomaly. So these are the different responsibilities that each of those um, people need to do. What was interesting is, and Renata will talk about this, is her experience was very good because the people that she was mapped with were really great. Whereas we've had other staff who've had and coach advisors and learning designers whose skill set didn't match their own and actually didn't work as well. So, and we found that, that was kind of, that's one of the learnings that we find is quite interesting, that people's skills they bring is quite, quite an interesting way. So we've just got a little video here, and um, it's only about a minute, so it won't be too tedious. Didn't know a lot about the walker before embarking on the journey. What I did know, However, was that there were a team of staff dedicated to course design and redevelopment. So I was pretty enthusiastic and keen to explore how I could engage with the Waka. One of my first meetings was just walking into a meeting with the Waka and just thinking, uh, kind of, what am I doing? Who am I? And, and where do I fit in, in this process? So it was really a baptism of fire. I felt a little bit at the very beginning as I am under some kind of investigation, you know. <laughs> it was a little bit of, you know, I was not sure what was expected from me, but uh, we overcame that very, very quickly. My expectations were, were really uncertain because when I developed courses before, it had been, I've got this course to write or this, you know, this um, stuff to write for my students and get it, get it out there, get it ready to go pretty quickly without a lot of interaction with other people. Actually, I appreciated that the team offered me practical tools how to, uh, for example, um, organize one session in such a way that it becomes more dynamic, more interactive, that we have several parts within those two hours, not only me talking to students, but you know, for things that go in both directions. Very beginning and very end, it was collaborative. 
that middle part was mostly my job because nobody else can, of course, make that content uh, applicable uh, for students. I think what was really important about having um, two different people, uh, well, three, you know, people involved in the project was that you're getting a range of opinions. Um, you know, quite often, um, you know, quite often we'll have a discussion, and then we're getting, uh, we're either. Uh, we're either challenging each other's opinions or we're coming up with different point of views and it means that you know we can get a more grounded um, output in terms of the direction that we head in, in, that, in that manner and um, obviously uh, three hands are, are better than one. So if I was talking to a teacher who was going to be um, going into the process I'd, I'd, I'd get them to think about um, be very clear about what they feel like they're bringing to the process, get really familiar with their content and what they're wanting to achieve with the course. So I think if you know those two things, that's a lot of the work kind of um, set up to, to go well uh, first. Think about the types of questions that you want to be asking of um, your curriculum editor and your learning designer. Where are your gaps and what support do you kind of need? So I think the, the more you can articulate that beginning of the process, the better the process will go. It's also given me a framework to share with colleagues. You know, we've, we've had, I've already done that through uh, uh, one of our staff meetings where I presented an entire overview of the course. And it was really interesting because in that particular staff meeting, we had a number of former students who are now staff members who actually did this course quite some years ago. And they were just sitting there going, oh my goodness, this looks so cool. This looks like so up to the minute and I wish this course looked exactly like it does now when I did it. Okay, so now I'm going to hand over to Renata. She's specifically going to talk about a case study about history in, within history theory. Annabelle, can I just ask a question? When you said that um, they pulled someone out, yeah. that they would presumably have to pull, eventually pull everybody out to do this? Well, or? we don't know that. We've got another round of funding, so I think they're committed to about four years of intensive, uh -huh. and then we will see what happens. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens, you know. Um, Across a year, when it's about 0.1 FTE for a staff member to be pulled out. Okay. Yeah. Hello, everybody. My name is Renata. Uh, this was a big journey, really, literal journey for me as well, especially since I arrived in New Zealand in December 2015. So I was new to New Zealand, to Auckland, <coughs> to English-speaking country and teaching in English at all, you know. So uh, I was born, educated uh, in Belgrade, and I worked at the Belgrade Faculty of Architecture for many years, climbing slowly from teaching assistant through lecturer, senior lecturer, finishing. Uh, bachelor, Master, Master of Science, PhD, all those levels. Uh, taught all courses, of course, as all the young people at the beginning, always design studio, but history of architecture and theory of architecture always were my main field, let's say, and I'm passionate about that. I have always been in my PhD and Master of Science work from that field, let's say. Uh, when I arrived to Auckland, I was given this task maybe a few months after I arrived, immediately. So I actually was not prepared at home for online learning almost at all. Uh, Belgrade has strong and very old and good school of architecture. Internationally recognized, accredited from RIBA, French National uh, School of, uh, for Architecture, Bologna of course, so really European school. But online learning is not something that they are maybe even aware of importance of that or, or existence of that enough. On the other hand, school is, was very up to date with everything that was going on around. And I actually do have just a few slides that I will run through because it's not important for us at the moment about that background that I brought with me. I had thorough investigation of my own research in teaching history especially and how we should do that today, but more in terms of A and B. So the way how material is presented 
and the active role that should be given to students. So C, online experience, is something that I got at Unitech. And all of that I tried to put together in the course that I was in charge of. So just to run through two big competitions that happened in Belgrade, for Belgrade, in 2009 and 2020, where first winners were uh, Daniel Libeskin here, Fujimoto here, then big conferences organized in Belgrade, again with star architects, but all of that was connected about teaching in architecture as well. And we published after those uh, conferences books of interviews with architects, star architects, who all design in historical environment and teach history as well, history and theory. So we wanted to hear from them. Johanny Palazma delivered big workshop for master and PhD students for one whole week. And it was a good chance for school to pick up from them advices about A and B that I showed uh, in, this, in this first slide. Uh, from that I developed some kind of, a, I have that in four slides, my own teaching approach or teaching philosophy, if you want, in terms of those core courses, program, general survey courses that, con that considers history of architecture or theory of architecture. And I understood and already started to implement uh, my, I call them special techniques, that was always for assignments to be visual, visual, visual. Uh, for students to prepare plans from photographs, drafting sections, elevations, making models, whatever. Always to have, of course, small research and verbal presentations through their lecture seminars. And I wanted always to give them more freedom in interpreting. Because from my experience, I learned that students behave completely differently in design studio environment and in core courses, in, especially in history and theory. They are afraid of making mistakes. And I found that very restrictive, how they approach uh, courses. That was connected with skills, of, of course, that they uh, developed uh, by using that method. So method for me was more important than information. And everything for me was uh, kind of uh, important to be presented from a point of view of present day demands of what is problem situation in architecture of the day. So to connect somehow that history of architecture and theory of architecture to architecture as a discipline and architectural practice, industry that is going on around us. And to connect it with design studio as well. To actually to have similar approach involved. It of course had to be different if we talk about general survey courses in history, in theory, or elective courses where you, are, where you have better freedom to, to combine those things. And always it was important what was class size, what was class level, are we first year students or third year students, and space in which we work. So this is something that I brought here, and that I had in my kind of a mind before I approached critical studies course development for UNITEC. Critical studies is one quite clear line of courses that are connected and interrelated and a little bit even, or totally, let's say better, chronologically developed. So I inherited something that already existed and something that was strong course that was run by my colleague, whom I appreciate very much, who accepted me open-heartedly to Unitech and to in Oakland. And uh, it was chronologically developed history of architecture. And of course, I brought my knowledge and my content and my way of teaching that I presented on previous four slides. So for me, actually, I saw my task as combination of something that only at Unitech I realized that it is called active learning, but that I applied in my teaching already for some time before. And I understood that online as platform that will help me uh, to make that good and easier for students. So for us in critical studies course, it was not at all not even in one moment I think idea to have fully online course. 
we didn't mention that. And it is not generally, I think, so much important even at this stage. But now, when I'm listening to all of you throughout the morning, I think that what we have, and I'll show you uh, the, of course, page now, uh, can be 100% online if we decide that way. It is something that can be done maybe even without me. I'll show you and then you will tell. So for me, I understood online and active as blended learning, and I saw flipped classrooms as something that will be useful and that will be very helpful. So I understood that I have huge material that I already use in my teaching, for example, short parts of movies. I always use movies in my teaching. And I was always very up-to-date, so BBC, National Geography, I knew everything, always what was up-to-date. So I picked up pieces of, of, of that and that to show to them and then to, for us to discuss. Now I decided to use that material, but to provide actually a set of questions for students and to ask from them to search for answers by watching those movies. So not only here is the movie, see the movie, and learn yourself, but rather pay attention to this, because I expect you to have information about this particular thing. So I, uh, because, so actually how that active role, I understand, was given to them, through that uh, before, during, and after scheme, we always had something as preparation for class, something that was going on on the class, and something that was uh, expected from them to do after the class. When we talk about online experience, uh, it was done through Moodle, Moodle pages, how we operate. And we have something that, that is called individual wiki and something that is called forum or question and answer forums. We also do have online quizzes and we have turned it in for major assignment as I assume most of you haven't used. So how I decided to, to divide that material because I kept chronological structure because of clarity and because of other courses that are connected with mine. So I cannot now make something that is completely different. We have to still be consistent within that line of courses. But I wanted actually within that chronology to have another framework. And that framework for me was uh, important to connect for students with design studio, as I told you, and with, with architectural practice. So I wanted for everything that I ask from them or that I deliver to, during my small period, to have something that is context, something that, and then Vitruvius famous triad. So they need to know something about structure, materials of the building, something about function of that building, what is that, what type of building we are talking about, and how we circulate through it. Do we know parts of that building, for example, because of terminology that we still use in our architectural practice today. This is not connected only to history. Terminology is the same today. So if you design, for example, church, you need to know what is nave and what is transept and what is aisle. So th that was my idea. And of course, aesthetic uh, characteristics and terminology. So everything that was pre-class was online, of course. It was carefully guided and structured. And it was my goal was to provide something for them that would, instead of just to learn facts, they need to do something to do something with history. During the class, that is face-to-face -face time, we have that twice per week, per two hours, one and a half to two. And it is, again, not only me talking, it is group discussion and lecture. So group discussion is sometimes vivid, sometimes not that active. And then when we have class like that, I make longer lecture. But generally for each class I have both options. So I respond to what is going on in the classroom that day. It cannot be said <laughs> differently for me because it doesn't work then. Uh, and post-class activities that actually I was advised by my team, I really had a good team. It didn't work perfectly from the first moment, but then we somehow found uh, the way to function 
I really worked hard to prepare that material, but they were very helpful, really. So, uh, in all possible sense, with advices and especially technical support. Without that technical support, it would not be possible. So the advice was, okay, why don't you pick something? Because they didn't know anything about my, of course, topic about content, but they advised me, uh, bring something that will be snowball effect for them, something that they will take, <coughs> that, will, that will kind of open their imagination. And here actually was, you know, from my slide where I show you how I wanted to let them free, to, to give them freedom to interpret, this is what I did here. Because for material that I prepared there, actually, they can be wrong, nobody cares. For me, it was important that they think, that they think about the architecture, and to, that they can make connections for themselves, something that will, that will really work. And, okay, so rule of collaborative, individual wiki question, and I told you this. Let me, let me now show you the page itself, and how does it really work. So this is the main page for Critical Studies 1 course. I divided it, so I wanted to have that banner. I made that with, with their help. I wanted to give a message as soon as they opened their own page that we are not, I mean, in chronological sense, we are finishing here. So somebody else teaches this. I'm only until here. But I wanted that they understand that we are actually talking about something that influenced here as well. So to understand, uh, there is something else behind. I somehow, for some time, already felt that students often resist courses in history. They, they are not happy with that. They, unfortunately, so I am miserable if I am standing in front of full amphitheater. In Belgrade it was 300 students, in Auckland it is 130 students. If I see their faces sleepy and that they are not listening to me, I feel that I failed, that I failed that exam, you know. So I wanted to, uh, to, to make sure that they will love the course, that they will be provided with something that will open up their imagination. We are not talking about old, boring history that is not important for us. We are talking about aspects of history that are architectural, that are design problems of a corner or transition between square base and circular dome that are still important today, that I'm sure Frank Gehry knows because otherwise he would not be possible to, it would not be possible for him to design buildings as we know. So that was kind of my, my main goal. goal. So let me just show you first the main page, which is here. No, how come that will? Okay, let's let's do like this. So main page is that banner, and of course most important information, course info here, assessments and all explanations about that here, quizzes are here, and termitin is here. So everything that will be marked is kind of in the same folder. The rest of it is their content, let's say big content, divided chronologically. But then, with help of my team, I managed to, you know, make that difference in colors between old period, uh, ancient architecture, medieval architecture, between uh, Renaissance and Baroque, like New Era, and to superimpose the most important pictures of each with those colors, and to have other worlds in, in different color, and all those kind of things. And then when you open, for example, Egypt or any other courses, you have that structure, prepare for the class, during the class, and follow-up activities. So in prepare for the class, they have movie. It's always a movie. Sometimes it is just five minutes movie, sometimes it is 25 minutes movie. It depends what I have for what. All of them are architectural documentaries or BBC or national, so very legitimate sources. And my questions divided in firmi context, firmitas, utilitas, venusas. And questions that I ask are always in firmitas connected to construction or structure or materials used for that building in that movie. And then if the movie is long, which is in this case, then I kind of even write 
minutes and seconds we have to look at if they don't have time maybe you know to carefully watch the whole of the movie I really wanted to make that easier for them so this is preparation for the class during the class we are divided so that's a little bit tricky because we have a big lecture theater so I somehow organize them in group of six to turn around maybe towards each other and have conversation about those questions then I have lecture and then I divide that in a few topics to make it easier for them after class I upload of course that PowerPoint and follow-up activities are always uh, two parts <coughs> that part that is in the most important thing because you will be asked that at the exam that is the message so terminology that they need to know because they really have that as a, as a exam later but green activities are that snowball effect that I wanted them to have and here I have for example for uh, Egypt I have Ming Pei and his pyramid in Louvre and then I have new series of questions with which, first of all, so what was my idea? Okay, first they will know about contemporary architecture as well. So they will, be, they will become familiar with what is going on in the world around us, not only in history, but in today. Second of all, they will know about Pritzker Prize and all those kind of things, because then I link, for example, I say, I say this architect was awarded the Pritzker Prize, and then they can link and go to Pritzker Prize, so they will be familiar with the most famous awards that exist in the world of architecture. And third of all, they will compare things. So I ask them to compare Ming Pei Pyramid with the Egyptian Pyramid, in terms of material, in terms of size, in terms of context. And this is a whole lot of, you know, classes for, for every single topic I have. And we have discussion forum here. So actually post-class activities are individual wiki for red part and discussion forum for green part. Then we also have, have explored more where I have complete textbook uh, from my colleague from whom I held this course and I have recommended reading for example from books that are like Trappenberg or you know important books of history of architecture and then I always incorporate something for some of them who maybe want to explore really more and you know to understand the whole philosophy of Egyptian book of that and to connect that with Egyptian temples and for example how we uh, understand space and all those kind of so that's basically how I imagined that, understood that, and I would love to go through every single of those topics. I know that you cannot share the same passion for that as me, but I'll, I'll, um, I think you have impression about what I was talking uh, here. So what, okay, so it all sounds interesting and, and uh, I don't know, for somebody maybe it is too much, for somebody it is like, okay, I would love to try that, but uh, what we found <coughs> at the moment, maybe still not resolved in terms of what I'm showing you here. First of all, although I can have, I can track, for example, number of visits to each of activities that I prepared as Milica presented in her, presentation previously, I, I at the moment don't have that. So it still didn't occur to me to raise that at the level of proper research and see how students respond to what I uh, prepared here. Why also it is hard for me at the moment to do that? Because this is not assessed. So everything that I show to you is something that I prepared just for them to have and to be inspired and to enjoy and if they, if they are uh, in love with architecture they will do that but if they are not in, and if they have other important stuff that are going on at that time they will do less or even some of them nothing you know so because we do have like major assignments we do have exam we do have other things that we still keep there so it is almost like at the moment, you know, a double message maybe, maybe. but 
we'll see what yeah. we can do. I think we're we just at that moment of change where, because Renata's has taken over this particular course and it was quite well set out, we're at that moment of either it's got to switch and move yeah. to being much more hybrid driven um, and something different, but it's at that moment where it has to be decided. And yeah. that's kind of an interesting yeah. thing. We've been talking about it a lot, yeah. actually. Yeah, and it's not something that just I will decide. It's a group of colleagues who are all great teachers who have their own way. And this is a little bit, you know, for some of them, too much or weird or are you sure that it works, you know. We have all kind of responses, but generally, uh, students without having exact data about that, but from my interaction with them in classroom, I think they appreciate what, what is offered, and especially at the beginning of school year. They passionately start. They do everything that is written there. And then when other things come, you know, it's less and less. Uh, I somehow hope and I have a dream that maybe we can make uh, that structure, pre-class activities and post-class activities as their big portfolio. You know, like we have portfolio in design studio, again, because I wanted that to be visual, I wanted them to do something, I wanted them to interpret things. It will make things easier for us later in architectural theory course, because they will already develop critical thinking as first year students. And they will know how to discuss when they are older. So all those kind of things are still there, and if we maybe make that portfolio to uh, become something that exists instead of exam, probably they would follow everything, I, I, I assume. Okay, I'll ask that. So you, you, uh, from what I understand, you're saying that a lot of this is, it isn't directly assessed? It is not um, at all. So, but, but does it link to assessment? It helps them with their yes, assessment? Yes, yes, yes. For so, example, red part of individual wiki, it is di directly uh, connected to exam. Also, prepare for class. So that type of questions, they will be asked yeah, so at they, the they, exam. So they, they do realize Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Everything so is they, interrelated. OK, so they, they're not, it's not completely no, uh, no, no. Uh, outside. It goes, the it goes totally into that direction. It can, I think, completely replace other uh, things that we have assigned for them at the moment. That's pretty shocking because I find that even with normal courses, if something is not assessed, if there's lectures that go on that they know aren't assessed, they just won't turn up. Yeah. So it's, it's sort of it's, good it's that, they're, that they're I mean, it starts, engaging with, with yeah. what you're doing and, and then, knowing it's not being assessed. Yeah. Uh, when they realised, uh, I mean, I repeated that at the beginning and it seems like very clear at the beginning. It is more, I think, in their case at the moment that a number of their workload when it starts you know, growing, then they disengage with this. But at the beginning of school year, probably for the even first half of the term they are totally, we can have proper discussions before I start delivering. And I think that's really the take out is the fact that um, Unitech has put time in for something that they don't really know what the outcome is. Um, and that's kind of quite interesting. And so we're just kind of running with it and kind of seeing where it's going to take us, you know. And it, we know that it's going to be a hybrid. We don't believe it's going to be fully online. But where, how it kind of moves and weaves in and out, that's kind of, that journey is actually really interesting. And so, yeah. Yeah, because the, the actual cost of of support, we I, I don't know what other people experience, but the amount of support we get, we really have to push for that support. Yeah. Yeah. We have like to go and get a grant outside of architecture yeah. in order to put together my course. There's, there's nothing wonderful like this that's this there. This is really one and support as well. <laughs> for example, practice quizzes, because quizzes are part of their, again, exam. So they have... Uh, to get some kind of ID test. They need to recognize certain buildings from the history of architecture to know uh, approximate period. And so we prepare that online and we prepare that in such a way that students can uh, have many tries before official one, before that exact day when we have the test. And then I, I for example, can pull out how many of them assessed, who of them, uh, what were the results, although I don't mark that, of course, but you know, uh, some of them really practice, practice, practice until, until they become 
perfect and their real result is really very good then because they went through that online. This is something that is, for example, prepared really good, I think, at the moment online. So there's a couple of questions. The support you get is technical people helping you put together that, that platform? Officially, it was like also that learning designer. I had one uh, person in that team who was supportive in terms of, for example, that structure, that, that word snowball effect. I would never come with that. Although I raised those questions for students, but he kind of uh, was uh, helpful in terms of asking me general questions that, that what my teaching should bring to their learning for example, what the most important thing I want them to pick up from that, and then I say, that, okay, what is the most important? I guess they're they're educational, um, pedagogical. I think, yeah, point yeah. of view, and that's what they're really bringing. They're so talking so about he, he or she's from the education part. They're well. they're from the Walker, so they're employed specifically just to do that. They, they might be not even from Unitech previous. That's right, and no. they're just they're coming in, and that's the only task, and they yeah. might be with architecture. Yeah one day a week and yeah. then with um, um, nursing another yeah. day. And they don't have full uh, tenure positions at Unique Tech. They just have short term <coughs> contracts to finish that job. But most, mostly their help was technical support. And, it was and so the 37 hours that you talked about before. That's, that's every academic, um, it's about them upskilling so that they understand how this and the technology works. So like we were um, Blackboard, and then we move to Moodle, and there's some people that use Moodle very well, and some people that don't use it very well. There's some people that were just getting their head around how to use Turnitin, in, and so it's about really getting the staff, <coughs> the academic staff, up to a level that they can engage with so, it. So Renata, having done her 37 hours, could then go and write this. I did my 37. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We've done our 37. <laughs> 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 Renata, or the, these were your hours? No, they don't count. No, they, they don't, don't count. count. So yeah. You have to actually go to a formal class. Yeah. So the, yeah. the, this actual, um, this, this specific so thing is I not counted is towards it. So no, it's, it's not. It's a, a, on the top of that. So I first yeah. had to go to hear about blended learning, about flip class, about active learning. And I was actually curious. I liked it because in active learning I recognized things that I already did, you know. So I intuitively applied already active learning in my teaching without having any theory behind, you know, or being aware of it, let's say, consciously. So it was a combination of <laughs> it was really exciting. And how were you choosing courses to go through this process? Um, Head of school. <laughs> <laughs> that was my fault. <laughs> well, maybe now if we, um, oh, first of all, thank Renata and Annabelle.